Hello, Yes But Why listeners. This is your host, Amy Jordan. Welcome to Yes But Why, episode 255, my conversation with Austin improviser Lahari Dunn. But first, let's talk about our sponsors. Today's episode is sponsored by Audible. Get your free audiobook download and your 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. You know, lately I had been using Audible to listen to self-help books. Make me a better mother, a better person. But the other day I just needed something new to distract me from my frustrations. I found The Dispatcher by John Scalzi. Dark, yes, but so good. Definitely cured me of my fury. So listen up. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why and download that app. You get a free audiobook immediately, and there's so much included content once you sign up. Our other sponsor for today's episode is podcastcadet.com. My husband Chris and I run the company podcastcadet.com. Let us help you with your podcast. We can give you a little push, or we can help you with the production of all of your podcast episodes. This week, I taught an improv for podcasters workshop through squadcast.fm, and we all had a blast. It's stuff like that, or even the most basic stuff, like how do I get my podcast on Spotify? Contact podcastcadet.com, and we'll show you how. We can help. Use promo code YBY20 to let us know you heard about us through Yes But Why podcast, and you'll get 20% off the first service or workshop you buy. In today's Yes But Why interview, I talk with Austin improviser Lahari Dunn. Lahari has performed and directed at the Institution Theater, the Hideout Theater, Merlin Works, and Cold Town. I found it really fascinating to hear another perspective of the Austin improv community. Listen in as we chat about imaginary friends, TikTok, and musical improv. I now present to you Yes But Why episode 255. Lahari Dunn on how Austin Improv has shaped her as a performer. Enjoy. I'm Amy Jordan, and this is Yes But Why Podcast. Yeah. When you were a kid, were you always the kind of kid who uh, was into performing? Were you performing for your family or how did you, you know, use your creativity when you were a little kid? I was the only child and I didn't have any brothers or sisters. So I'd make up imaginary friends, imaginary worlds, and I would perform in them. And I would make up all of these elaborate plays and perform them in my bedroom. I don't even know it was my bedroom. I think it was my parents' bedroom. And I would just like spend two hours before dinner, after school and just build these worlds. And I eventually, um, I danced a lot as a little kid, not as a professional dancer. I never took any ballerina or anything like that. I would just watch musicals and, you know, kind of mimic them. And then uh, my mother was like, oh, you're a good dancer. Why don't I have you um, start doing Indian um, dancing, meaning uh, classical dancing, which is a very structured form of uh, a dance that comes from southern India, which is called Bharatanatyam. And I started doing that. And then I started performing in for, and I grew up in Paducah, Kentucky, the South. And so mother would always have, go to churches and explain stuff about India. And then I would go do this, you know, dance at a Southern Baptist church, <laughs> you know, this classical Indian dance and people were impressed and of course tried to convert us into Christianity and we were like no we're good but thank you (laughs) and it became something that um 
I would do, uh, but it became more intimate with uh, uh, Indian Indian friends. Like we had a major in, in Indian community um, while I was growing up and we would have all these parties. And then especially around Diwali, which is of course a major Indian holiday or Hindu holiday, every year I would do a dance and that would be something that I would do. And then eventually I would start singing Bollywood songs or religious songs because my family was very religious, a conservative Hindu family. And so that is how I performed when I was a child. I also did the choir, but I don't think my choir teacher really liked me because I was the only child and I wanted to do the solo all the time. And, uh, and then, yeah, no, I enjoyed being in choir. Yeah, no, I, I performed a lot, but I didn't do that. And also was in band, blah. but we, our school didn't really have a drama program. And when I wanted to be an actress, oh boy, uh, that was something my parents did not want me to do. <laughs> All right, wait, before we go into every parent's uh, disappointment that we're all involved in theater, um, <laughs> tell me how, because I, you know, did my research, I was like, she grew up in Kentucky. You're like, yeah, so then I did these traditional Indian dances, and I'm like, who's doing traditional Indian dances in Kentucky? But what you're saying is the town that you grew up in had an ample enough uh Indian uh, community so that like, you know, other people were involved in the dances and you had sort of like religious groups and whatnot? Yeah. So what happened was um, originally it wasn't, there were only a handful when I was born in 1976. At the time, there was only very handful, a group of Indian people. But what happened was that people in the outer um, towns, like in more rural towns, like I grew up in Paducah, Kentucky, which is actually a relatively large town for that area. But then you would have like people that 20 miles away that were Indian that, you know, wanted to be friends or wanted to, you know, they all got together and then, or be some people from Tennessee it was always a probably a, an hour drive. We had this tight community of people. And um, sometimes they would have religious functions. And so, yeah, that's where we would do all these, you know, performances and have like prayer groups. It was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's great for doing performances as well, like to have this sort of structured idea like, especially with religious stuff, you're like, you want to learn public speaking? We've got some speaking that needs to be public. Mm -hmm. Like, get involved, you know? Interesting. Right. Yeah, no, and, and a lot of the girlfriends and I are still friends to this day. Like, we've just reconnected on Zoom um, just recently, and we started a text uh, group, um, a group chat, as they call it these days, around COVID. <laughs> And it's been great connecting with them because they're all now doctors and, you know, nurses and they're all talking about their experiences. And I'm like, uh, nah, I just miss improv. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, their COVID experiences must be very wild, uh, for sure. All the work that they're doing all across the country. Wow. But so and a part, but back to where I was as a child, <laughs> my mother was also a part of the homemakers. Like she would wear a sari every day, but she had like a really good group of girlfriends. They were all Southern Baptist or Methodist women, and they would you know, bake cakes and it was called the homemakers. And my mother was a part of that group. So they would have their own churches and they would invite my mo mother, their friend to speak about India. And they would ask me, can your daughter dance for, you know, us at this church? And yeah, that's what I did sometimes. That's amazing. Go, good on you for being so brave to, uh, you know, do it 
in a crowd that's not like it's one thing if it's like traditional dances and everybody's doing it but right. like it's another thing to be like hey you want to see something new and different let me show you that new and different thing and everyone's like oh, wow right but at the time i didn't think i was brave i just wanted sure <laughs> I mean, I didn't know microaggressions or racism at the time. You know, I was like, well, even though I may have experienced, I'm, I'm definitely have experienced at that point. I'm just like, ooh, somebody is paying attention to me. I'm on stage. Let me do my dance. I mean, I hear you. I feel <laughs> like I have received enough positive attention in my life to have um, distracted me from the bad. And I usually just, I feel like that's my defense mechanism for stuff. Like if somebody's trying to be mean to me, I just like throw on the charm or like remind everybody in the room, like, um, I'm sorry, I'm hilarious and great. And you guys are excited that I'm here. Just so we're clear, that's what's <laughs> happening right now. Uh, so if anyone gives me any guff, I'm usually just like, oh, I'm sorry. Did no one tell you I was the coolest person? Oh, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, like really heavy, overt, uh, puffed up confidence. That's that's how I get through. And also acting like I'm a celebrity when I'm not. That's But it's a good <laughs> good way to get through things you know then people are like i don't understand was she famous you're like no <laughs> but, but they leave me alone you know <laughs> oh man so you're doing these dances you know did you you mentioned that your school didn't have um theater which you know my i didn't have theater until i went to high school and even then it was because i chose to go to this private school for girls and then the theater was at the private school for boys and i liked boys so i was like yes we will go over there mm -hmm. and hang out with the boys um and that's how i got involved in theater what what got you into um later performing if it wasn't in school um, did you get on stage uh, again doing more, uh, you know, Indian traditional dances um, at cultural events or, you know, did you find plays or you mentioned also singing in the uh, in the choir as well? How did it develop? Ah, oh, interesting question. I don't think I did anything after my sophomore year in high school. Um for a very long time I did perform in a college thing once it was um a dance that I did for Diwali because you know I went to a school where it was a big enough Indian community that I wasn't that involved with but you know I danced and wanted to do and I found that to be really fun but I did some theater in college meaning I took a theater class and then I did take a theater class when I first moved to Austin, but I, that was in 2002 and it was a long time. And then I really, then my job got more and more involved and, and then I was going through my life and my job was very consuming at the time. And it was like through a bunch of layoffs and I realized, I don't know if this is the right path for me. And then I had a really good girlfriend of mine say, hey, let's do stand up together. Because whenever we got together, we'd always, you know, we'd always be like, hey, that would be a great stand up the way you talk about men or hey, that would be a great stand up the way you talk about politics. And we kept talking about doing it. And we eventually signed up back in 2012 to for at Cap City. And we both killed and honestly, I, that was an amazing feeling. And then we kept going, signing up for more and more um, <clears throat> places and we found it was more male dominated. And so that's when my girlfriend's like, why don't we start doing improv? And I'm like, okay, why not? And I was a little nervous because I thought it would be consuming my time. Um, but it actually ended up working out really great. And I fell in love with the stage like I initially didn't really I don't know if because I was older than everybody in the class because I was like in my 30s 
mid thirties when I started and everyone else was way younger. I think that I felt that sort of insecurity start to settle in a little bit initially. And I was kind of nervous on stage, but once you find your people, you know, once you find your people that you perform with or in troops with, or you start gravitating towards, it didn't matter anymore. So I felt more comfortable. And then you start taking more and more classes and you become involved and you just get lost in everything. And then age just falls away. You know, you can be endowed as anything. It doesn't matter. You can choose to endow yourself as anything. And I, that's the one thing I really miss now is the stage, the stage and the laughter of the audience. And I even miss the bad shows where nobody laughed <laughs> because you wanted, you, you get to feel something, a reaction from someone and it's, and it's improvised and it's on the moment and to see a group of people react in a certain way or to feel that energy is just something, you know, different in any the theatrical form, I think now, because people give improv such a bad, you know, I mean, that's the, it's the joke of every television show, you know, like, but I felt like, the best show that did kind of did a better job of kind of showing the beauty of it was honestly Bojack Horseman or no, 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 actually, no, it wasn't. It was, um, have you seen that show? Um, you're the worst. No. On FX. It's a very good show. All seasons of it are on Hulu. If you have Hulu. Mm -hmm. Um, but the guy with PTSD that came back from Iraq, he uses improv to actually feel better or to work through his emotions in a way. And I, I always thought that was a great way of portrayal of it. Yeah, no, I, that, yeah, that's great. Yeah, no. And I, I do find improvisation such a fun art form and it's a true improvised way of doing it. Yeah. You're not rehearsing anything quote unquote or, you know, there is improvised style, which is actually really hard to do, depending on the show you're trying to to make. But no, I, I, yeah, I, I love it. And I am now thinking whether or not I want to do scripted work or start taking more serious acting classes. I don't know. We'll see. Hmm. Exciting. Exciting <laughs> new things on the horizon. Most you know, fun. you know, I think they make fun of, um, improv because because there are certain aspects of it that are you know bouncy and gamey in the way that like comedians in general want people to laugh at them but then they they want you to think they're like cynical and dark and like brooding you know what I mean like like they're like yeah I'm really funny but like I'm dark on the inside <laughs> And I'm always like, I guess, uh, I mean, I'm dark on the inside, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I want to wander around and tell people, Hey, I'm real cynical about things. Watch out. I could be pessimistic. Like, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. But the thing about improv and the way that a lot of improv, like certainly short form and a lot of the what is referred to and i've learned from many people in chicago is not chicago style but what is referred to as chicago style the sort of like ucb bouncy like game like in your face like that sort of improv is i think what people got tired of really quickly and they were like i don't want to explore this anymore and then they started making fun of it because it was like it was like people in theater, you know, we all want to be goth and uh, wear dark eye makeup and be like, listen, I understand the darkness of my soul. But improv is like the opposite of that because it's like, hey, do you know that we all have a darkness inside our soul and we're going to work against it? Yeah. Like um, it's it's all about like positivity and being, you know, good to each other you have to take care of your teammates you know what i mean as opposed to 
a lot of comedy, which I, I've taught a, a ton of level one. And the number one thing I always have to stop people from doing is like undercutting each other for the purpose of comedy. It's like, no, no, um, no, you're not trying to make him look bad. You're trying to make him look good. Mm hmm. Like, I know that we've talked about comedy characters and comedy characters are dumb and don't learn lessons. And they're going to keep trying that door handle, even though every time they touch it, it buzzes. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're trying to be mean to each other. We're just trying to facilitate this thing, right? So it it's easy to make fun of because it's like, it's like positive people and joiners. And people being like, let's be positive and love each other. And no one likes that. People like that in their heart, but they don't like it when they're trying to be cool. Mm. Coolness and goodness are antithetical a lot. Um, Very true. <laughs> I mean, you know? Yeah. No, you're right. And, but I do feel that improv has the capability of other outside of the whole Chicago quote unquote Chicago style aspect. Oh, totally. There's narrative, there's hair the Heralds or I don't even know if Harold would be more into that. I mean Harold is a very intense and can be quite done beautifully. But oh my gosh, if you question the Herald on any form of social media, good lord. <laughs> like you're 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 done as a comedian i feel like or right. done as a person <laughs> but no i enjoy the herald i really do um but i feel like yeah the short formy gaminess of it there's a lot of sticks to it too but it's very deep and it's sort of like embracing um yourself and i hate and, and this may come off as unpopular but i was i was reading about the juggalos have you read about them i'm aware of them yes yes i feel like they are so positive mm -hmm. and i there's this weird aspect of our society but they do good they actually do well you know i'm not an uh, insane clown posse fan by any means i mean i'm sure people are that's great but it's just not my style of music but oh my gosh, these people do take care of each other. And I don't know. I just, I don't, I kind of reminded me of the improv community in a weird way. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good, you know, but I feel like the community is also part of that positivity as well. You know? Yeah. I mean, I feel like it depends on where you're at and we are very lucky to be in Austin because Austin has such a large community of improvisers. So, you know, even though it's a small city, you can get lost in a crowd. Like you and I have literally been doing improv in the same city for many, many years and we've never met. But like, and that's insane. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> You know yeah. what I mean? But there's tons of people, tons of people that you know very well who have also been doing improv. I've never met them, right? For various reasons. Uh, you know, some, some, uh, you know, some of the rough political stuff we were talking about earlier regarding the theater that I was a part of that wasn't really super into intermingling with other theaters, which was a problem. Um, but, you know, also just because like there's a lot going on and there's a lot of different styles and you can get, you know, you can feel like, oh, my style's the right style and the other ones aren't. And there's a few different ways to do it. You know, I think they're all great. And I think that, you know, why not learn all the different kinds of stuff? It, it'd be like... <laughs> I don't know. I feel like it's so similar with so many things that people get angry and, and they're like, I like this more than that. I'm always like, okay, but if you could have a box of crayons with a bunch of different options for crayons to use, why wouldn't you take the whole box as opposed to taking one out and being like this orange crayons, the way you color and there's <laughs> no other way and everything's going to be orange and you're going to like it. And if you say you don't like orange, well, you just don't like coloring. And you're like, that's not what it's like at all. It is not. You know what I mean? You know, so especially to, uh, we were talking about like how 
uh, I love that COVID has opened you up to connect with some of your friends from high school and stuff like that. Like how awesome is it that you're like reconnecting and like, you know, maybe we all could have reconnected before, but like this idea of it, I totally did too. I like reconnected with my high school friends and like, I've talked to people that I haven't talked to in years, you know, because of this. And that's really great. It's also opened up the improv world right we live in the great town of austin great improv right good community lots of good stuff working together online and off right but mm -hmm. turns out there's a whole world of people who are putting stuff on and i meet them and talk to them about their journeys and it's like what there's this new way to do improv wait you guys do this how do you do it? You know, and it's really, it's like a big open ended, like, Hey, do what you want to do kind of art form and different groups frame it in different ways to do it. Right. Right. So it's just super fun. Right. And I mean, any show can be interesting as long as you have decent characters. I mean, in anything, I feel like character work is something that is pivotal regardless of how bad things are, you know, or what kind of form you take. If you play with patience, you don't necessarily have to be a certain grounded way of approaching things and you have a decent character. And I'm sure there are other aspects of it as well, you know, you know, technical wise, like people can hear you, you're giving your scene partner space to speak. Um, you're connecting with your scene partner. And most of all, you're having a wonderful time on stage. I don't care how you do it, you know? I don't care. As long as you're having fun, just do it. Right? Get up there and do some improv. Whatever that means to you, just do it. Mm -hmm. I teach level one. I teach them all these rules. I tell them that they obey the rules. And then right before they go out for their recital show, I go, if you guys disobey the rules, it's okay. And they're like, what? Like, yeah. They don't mean anything. Do it. Do it happens. It's fine. And they're like, what? Like, don't worry about it. No matter what happens, it's good. They're like, oh my God. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and do they perform well? I mean, I mean, level one recitals are mostly bad. So no. Right. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's not the point. The point is like the show, the show is my final lesson. Right. Right. Like I teach them eight classes where I give them exercises and then the, the show is the final exercise. Yep. And it's like an exercise where you give, you start the beginning of the exercise with a bunch of rules and parameters and one by one, you take them away. Right. Or it's like, you can only use your right hand. That's it. You can only use your right hand. You can only speak, it. you can only use words that start with W and, you know, just random stuff. That's like a game. And then, you know, when you drop it and you don't have so many things holding you back, you know, you should be okay. You know how to do it. It's really just about confidence. I, I mean, I, I feel like that's the key to everything. It's just like having confidence to do it. But I think getting into improv definitely requires some confidence because you have to be like, yeah, I'm cool with performing without a net. That's fine. I don't need, I don't need one. I'm all right. Yeah. Yeah. But that net, depending on the person, like can be there for a while. Oh, yeah. for them. You know, whether they take level two, level three, level four, level five, level six, or even take seven years of improv. It depends on how comfortable they are. I mean, you can see people um, sometimes take improv for a long time that you that have a net, a mental net, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's there. So I'm just curious, I guess, when you say that, how did their, their eyes, do your level one students kind of like, widen their eyes or are they like on stage kind of like I can do whatever I want or I I just like to shake them up a little bit right before they usually obey every rule like like it's so funny every class they've been breaking rules left and right and I've been like ah ah 
Can I do this? <laughs> when I tell them they can do anything they want, they obey every rule. <laughs> crazy uh, you know it, it it's like anything with you know when you give somebody freedom um you know when you give somebody you sort of create create this parameter it's like with kids too it's like you know if you set up like a thing where where you're you're making sure that they don't do something and then and then you like kind of let them do it they're they're yeah. so used to not you know, it's like, don't go in that door. You can't go in that door. That door is not for you. Don't walk through that door. And then if, even if you don't say anything after a while, they just know that's, that's not the thing to do. Right. And also like in improv with the rules, the things that you give them in level one, they're usually like, Hey guys, if you do this, it's going to make your life a lot easier. So try this. Right. You know, I usually present, present rules of improv that way. Where I'm like, listen, I'm not trying to tell you how to do your improv. I'm just trying to show you how you can do things slightly differently to make it easier on you. You have to come up with a lot of stuff. You have to do a lot of work, a lot of, a lot of heavy lifting. I'm trying to give you a back brace and, uh, and a dolly to help out, right? Right. About it, you know? Yeah. So earlier when you were talking about starting stand up, now first of all, just to jump back, you mentioned that you moved to town in 2002, but then you didn't start the stand up journey with your friend until 2012. So like the first 10 years you were in town, you were just like super focused on your um day job and and the work that you were doing and like digging in. Was it like right after college you're trying to like get in on your career? Yeah, I so I actually graduated in the end of 1999 and I started I actually lived in Vermont for six months um nice. work yeah it's great but cold um and then I moved to Austin I worked for a tech company and I'm in tech and so my my main focus was my work for you know and also having fun you know as a 20 year old um really did not I mean I did take a theater class in 2002 but I got laid off and then I think mentally I felt like oh I need to focus on my job because this is where I went to school for and I ended up just my job was pretty much a really major focus it wasn't my life but it was a major focus of my life and and especially you know, to, to before 2012, I felt the end of 2012, it was, a, it, it took a lot out of me. I loved my job at that point, but I felt, I kind of felt kind of burnt out at the time. Uh, I hope my former employers aren't listening, <laughs> but no, I, I did, there was a sense of burnout at the time. So I figured why not do something new? And my girlfriend and I um, decided to do stand up. And it felt so cathartic. And of course, that t attention that I had when I was a little girl, you know, dancing, I could feel that rush coming back in. I know it's time back in, you know, the, the, the need for attention, but, uh, you know, you felt like you're dancing, you know, on stage and you're making everyone happy. I mean, that, that feeling who wouldn't, who doesn't love that. And so, and I remember, it was a really big boys club though. And it was hard to break in and, you know, because sometimes my girlfriend and I had to wait till like 11 PM or 1130 PM while we had work the next day to, for our, like if we signed up for, um, what's it called? I can't even think anymore. What's like an open mic, an open mic. Yeah. We'd always be at the end of the pack. And I don't know, and I, and that's where I met Maggie May too. And I felt like she was always at the end of the pack too. And I felt like this isn't fair. So I can't take this toll on my job. Like the next day I would have a meeting like at 6 30 in the morning, you know, and I'm just like, okay, well, why don't we take a step back? And then I started doing improv and I wasn't that, I, I, I didn't, it was hard to dive into it for me quite a bit because a you can't you, it's the show's not all about you <laughs> right um <laughs> the 
especially if you're in a, I mean, it can be if you decide to do a solo show, but it's, it's more of a teamwork. And that was something that I had a hard time struggling with. Um, How present of mind of you. Well, yeah, (laughs) just, it's something that you have to come to terms with in a way. um, In order. Yeah, definitely. Right. To be a good performer, I think, whether it be scripted or not, you have to kind of put your ego in the back of your mind and kind of, or, you know, kind of do your thing. And so that took me a very long time and to get to that point, because I think once that goes away, everything kind of falls into place because the tools are there. You know, and I feel like once you let your ego go, it kind of happens. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I wonder, um, because you, you mentioned that you wanted to get into stand up and I appreciate this idea of like wanting the attention and like being, you know, trying to get the uh, attention, the spotlight stand ups good for that. Um, but it's, n- it's not great for the collaborative thing. Um, I mean, I agree with you that you need collaboration if you're going to be involved at all in, um, you know, theatrical pursuits. You're not going to be able to make anything alone. So you might as well um, learn how to work with other people. But like, how, like for real, how did you get over that hump? But there's a lot of people who do stand up that think the idea of doing improv is not something they want to do. And not just because, you know, they're in the camp we were talking about earlier. That's like, uh, Oh yeah, I love stuff. Yes. And, uh, but instead like they're the kind of people who, you know, they're like, no, I wrote this. I want the attention. I did the work. I want you to be like, you're the best. Not like that team you're on is pretty good. So like, how did you, how did you get, the fulfillment that you're looking for out of the performance, but with the group um, atmosphere that, you know, improv is all about. It came honestly over time, but for some people it takes a week. You know what I mean? Like some people are, and I, I know several people that, that one of the great example, and I don't know if you know her is Aspen Webster. She immediately took to it. She's an only child as well, but, she took to it and she immediately was the team player in her scenes. Another good person I can tell you is Jessica Von Schramm. She immediately te- takes in and she can be a team player. I just felt for me, it took a while. And I think what clicked was when I became friends with the people I was playing with and I really cared about their feelings and I really cared about who they were as people. And then especially I got into a class I think it was over the institution with Sarah Marie Curry, and we all ended up going to a soft. <clears throat> that ended up being one of those things. I really like these people. These are very talented human beings. I want them to do well too because they're so good, and I'm learning from them. I know it sounds so hokey to say that, but when you meet it's people- not hokey that's what people harass improvisers for they say it's hokey it's not hokey for you to feel positive experience it- for you to have happy feelings about a community experience yeah. don't feel bad about it yeah because i guess i'm in the most i'm i mean if you asked me pre-covid i totally wouldn't say i know it's hokey but now it's post-covid and anything kind is hokey i guess i don't know because <laughs> i'm not- uh, yeah I mean, I'm, I mean, I try to be a team player now, but I don't even know, you know, where my humor is or where, where, what I find funny anymore, <laughs> you know, that's the one thing that I, I learned from, um, I think, Coltown when I did their advanced studies, what do you find funny? Like, what do you really find funny? And now I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but so I, anyway, back to that, I think when you get to really meet the people you play with, and I had a had a really good group of people that some of them aren't involved with the community anymore or or I'm not that close to, but I felt like we're really extremely supportive and and you really care for these people. That's when you start saying, Oh, I need to make these people look good in order from and just for them. And then 
then you realize, oh, I'm just doing it mostly for them. I need to make myself look good. You know, it's kind of like a balancing act in a way because you still have to perform. You still have to bring on your A game as a performer. You still have to bring in good characters. Not good. I mean, whatever character you just you think is funny to you or whatever you think is good for you. But you still need to take, you know, give some and take some as well. So you find that balance at some point. And it took me a while to get there. But I think that has actually helped me in so many other aspects of my life. Like I felt after I did improv, like everything else fell into place, like coworkers, like I started doing really well in my, my job. I was, I used to hide like in previous, like whenever I had a side hobby, I'd be like, Oh, I don't know if people work would, you know, approve. Now I'm like, yeah. Um, Hey, I have a show in from March to April. Um, I'm not going to be working on this project. Or I tell like, you know, if, if I'm directing a show, I will tell the theater director. I'm like, no, yeah, no, that's where the project has a deadline. I won't be able to perform that show. How about we work? You know what I mean? Like there was a, a cohesive communication with my managers and me and they appreciated that I had a hobby and and it took about it was all about balancing your work your relationship you know because I'm married and your job you know improv and I love that juggling those three a lot it was fun yeah so you mentioned a couple times uh various different um schools in Austin that you have taken classes at what was your journey of taking classes and why did you like how did how did you bounce around what were you like oh I want to learn this I want to learn that I love that you've been to all sorts of different schools and I think that sounds exciting and fun um how did you decide where to start and, and how to move around so my girlfriend, I uh, was really good friends with the improviser who was involved at the hideout theater. And so that's where I started my classes. And when you're at the hideout, you just kind of get sucked in. And and I was kind of like, I don't know if there are any other sh- places I would want to go to. But then I met a saw, I actually, a soft subbed in for Andy Crouch, who was my um teacher my first teacher and I loved Andy he was so great he made he really made things fun and then a soft sub for him and I was like wow this guy's great too um and I started meeting more and more people after shows and learning more and more about other theaters and I oh I also did Merlin Works musical improv and then that had an amalgam of different people from various schools like the institution and I was like, well, I guess I have to go to the institution now. Um, and so I did that. I wanted to more learn more about character work and group dynamic there. Um, the storytelling part of the hideout was really fascinating to me. And I loved how building worlds and stories were such a great aspect of it. Um, and then, yeah, and then I, then I did a bunch of workshops for a long time and then I think before in 2019 I decided okay I'm going to do advanced studies at Coal Town and that kind of closed the whole I don't think it's closed yet I'm definitely going to go to to Fallout once this is done (laughs) once we're back to normal that's my main goal is to go to Fallout and start taking classes there to get you know to see what I don't know if I want to have a a minch but you know when you get the um, yeah yeah uh but I does that even truly exist anymore though I mean I don't know if that's even truly a thing how many of the theaters are even still full yeah. full throttle it's hard to know at the I... end of what is whatever the time of what COVID is we all thought it would be the year of 2020 turned out no 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 and uh yeah i don't know i mean almost i feel like half of them have lost their space you know um i don't think institution doesn't have a space cold town doesn't have a space um i hope merlin works is still in the other theater the zach you know but spaces are super weird now 
like the idea of it and how to do it, like hideout maintaining their space and follow up maintaining their space is just like magic and like dancing on a rainbow of hope, you know? (laughs) And it's, they're both like in the same proximity. I mean, they're so close to each other. That's what kills me. And they're in the most, they're in the prime real estate of Austin, which even kills me even more, you know? That's, I think it's hilarious. But not hilarious, yeah. ha, but, you know. Well, no, I mean, they've, uh, you know, <clears throat> I followed all of their, uh, as many journeys as I could about how things are working. And I think that there's a lot of, I mean, there's so many communities still going strong. Like Cold Town is still a theater and still a community. Mm-hmm. Um, they just don't have a physical space until they need a physical space again. Um but like, it's like, why pay rent if we can't teach classes for another six months? Um, but at the same time, like, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think maybe the whole idea of the way the communities work will be different now that we have more online openness. Mm-hmm. You know, now that it's like, you know, you could take. I mean, admittedly, the hideout intensive always had a smattering of international attendees, but now like any class you take that's online anywhere could have people from all over the world. So like, it doesn't even have to just be Austin, you know, artists anymore. It can be like, yeah, I took level one at the hideout and there were three guys from Germany and, uh, you know, who knows, you know, I don't know. Who knows how it's going to work? I like the idea that you're like trying to get as much knowledge as you can. That's super great. But the theaters that you've taken improv at have all sort of had different, different um, styles, different ways of looking at improv. So how did, how did that shape your, the way you look at improv? So I think I don't know how it, I think it shaped the way I took a scene, you know, to be honest. Um, And the hideout probably told me how to structure a story and whether it's a short form scene or a long form scene, AKA a narrative herald, um, this is the structure of a story in a way. Um, And then I felt like the institution, hey, this is how you build characters. These are grounds for character. It was more of um, kind of like, this is kind of like a technical way of approaching characters. And I learned that also at the Col- at Cold Town. Um, Merlin Works was like, hey, this is how you sing um, and really have fun singing. And yes, it was extremely fun, but it, I think Merlin Works brought like, oh, this is how you can have so much fun. And I felt like Cold Town was like, what do you find funny? what is fun in the scene for you? And I took that, if what I took for from Coal Town is like, what is fun in the scene for you? And it doesn't have to be funny per se. Like if you're arguing, you know, like I remember I was in the show called Shattered and I was playing this woman who was screaming at her mother. And I felt that was, we were saying horrible things to each other and the shattered was not necess- it was a dramatic improv show. And I remember I was just like screaming at her and I felt it broke me, but I had the most fun doing it, you know? And it, it, that's what I learned there. So it, that's how I feel now about an improv scene when you think about that. And thank you for asking me that. Cause that really helps me, you know, like, Oh, that's what I learned from all of that. Those, those theaters. Um, But I think that, you know, like anybody that takes any classes, you'll learn what, what is important to you and what you got out of it um, and how you build off of that. And I feel like a lot of workshops I've taken in the past, (laughs) you know, no matter how famous the teacher is, they'd always say at the end, I could be telling you, you know, something to do. You could completely leave this, this you know, room and just do your own thing or throw it out the window. I don't care. I'm just telling you what you think and what you had said earlier, like, um, just make it your own. But yeah, whatever aspect, whatever class you're in, you know, make, take some aspect of it and realize how important it is to you 
or what you gotten out of it and what made and one way you could do that is what made it fun for you you know I don't know yeah I I really love the storytelling aspect of the hideout um but yeah and the character work at the institution and the fun at Merlin works and the comedy at Coal Town I mean yeah I like the way that you've um you know been in, been able to take little pieces and and create your own style because I think that that's truly the key of improv like improv is all the things like people are like oh improv's dramatic oh improv's funny oh improv has game oh improv is storytelling and I'm like yep it's pretty much all the things as long as you didn't write it down ahead of time it's improv (laughs) like that's literally what it is and the reason why you take classes is purely just to like get some basic like skills uh as a team so that you are all playing with the same rules right so if like one person's playing baseball the other person's playing football another person's playing basketball that's not helpful you know, balls are going to go places, but they are probably not going to go where you want them to go, right? But if you try to take little bits from each one of those, um, you know, sporting events and try to turn them into something else in the moment, which I think is what improv is, it's like how do me and these other people that I'm going to share this moment with, how are we going to translate everything that we've learned from all the various improv classes that we've taken, how are we going to translate that into something that we can perform, right? Right, yeah. For me, the biggest thing that I think is the most important is not, it's not like improv theory or improv style or even storytelling. I think it's paying attention to your scene partners. Watch them for their, for their clues. See what ticks they've got. What do they like doing? And once you can learn those people, even if you like watch them each do one scene, you know enough about them to like give them something that you know that they like to do or create a scenario that you know they can handle or like, oh, I see they they like to do this kind of thing. So I will set them up to do that kind of thing, right? Because for me... I like that in your assessment of all the things that you learned, you're like, oh, I like doing this and I like doing that. I think because I was sort of trained as a teacher from the get. Like when I started the new movement, it was brand new. It didn't exist really. I moved to town and I got swept in. Mm -hmm. And I went from my graduating level class into teaching like immediately. So my whole experience of learning improv has been from the point of view of a teacher, right? I've done tons of stuff, but mostly I'm not the one performing. I'm the one facilitating and creating. And I've taught the same stuff over and over for years, but it feels different because it's different people every time. And so once that's what my experience was, I was able to impart that to my students to say the improv is not these rules that this group tells you or that group tells you. It's not this book or that book. It's the people in the room right now. And whatever we are, whatever our vibe is, that's what the show is. You're a hundred percent right. And honestly, I have not read an improv book. I tried reading. It. <laughs> Good. They're hard. And I know, and I've had friends, I'm sure they've written them and I'm like, I don't, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to read. I just want to experience it. Um, but yes, you're right. Exactly. Right. You're seeing, knowing your scene partner and what they're doing. And that's what I missed about the stage. How, I mean, mm-hmm. I can kind of get it in zoom, but I, I, I don't know. I just, I mean, I'm actually, I, I'm in a show right now. Um, that's going to be, I'm rehearsing for it. And it's an, it's an improvised, it's somewhat improvised and I'm having a lot of fun, but it, I already know the people I'm playing with to some extent. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. Like, I think one thing I miss about the stage is 
also the energy that you get from your same partner. And then I don't, maybe I need to translate that. That's the one thing about theater now. It's very strange. Even in movies, like, you know, you have to be in the same room with that person you're speaking, or maybe you don't, but, but that's where, you know, that's scripted. So I don't necessarily know if you need that tension to figure out what you're going to do next. I mean, you do, I guess, as a character actor or, or as an as a character, you would have to do that. But am I making any sense? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, totally. I mean, uh, Zoom improv is a whole other animal because you're missing a lot of the like visceral human elements that make improv great, like physicality, being near each other, something happening that like makes everybody laugh, like a group joke. Um, there's a lot of things that like, just don't pick up and sometimes they pick up on zoom, but like, sometimes it's, it's really, I feel like zoom improv is like improvisers on a crash course of how to do film. (laughs) Because like, because like all of us are way too loud right? How many of us have had to dial down the volume of our own microphones because we're projecting, right? Don't project, stop projecting, be quiet. And then there's this, well, there's been a lot of talk about this and I'd love to hear your opinion on it, but like when you do Zoom improv, do you look at the person on your screen or do you look at your camera to be engaged in a way that the audience who's looking sees you looking at them but you're also sort of looking at your scene partner in a way because and some people say no you have to look away at the person or else you're not connecting i'm like but then you and your scene partner aren't connecting now staring at my camera i'm not connecting either Mm -hmm. but i feel like i kind of am more Right. I don't, I don't know. What do you think? Do you look at the camera or look away? I lo- I don't look at the camera. I look at the person. You huh. know, I try to put my ca- I here's the thing. I try to put my uh the scene like right. I try to make it as as big as I can. And of course, I have this monitor where I can just kind of move it closer towards the camera, um, which is which is good. But that takes time to understand you know, I'm lucky enough to, you know, have a monitor that does it, you know? Um, but yeah, no, I look at the camera. I, I didn't never look at the camera. I look at, I look at the person that I'm looking at, but you're, yeah, that's what I do. I just, um, because I need to look at them. I need to see their reaction. I need to see how they're reacting in order for me to keep going to what I'm, you know, to keep, to see where the scene goes next or what I'm going to say next. Because where's the fun? Yeah. You know, so you're yeah, not plus like we're just talking about like it's about connecting with this other person. But th- so, it, but it's still like just this weird presentational like, what am I performing? How does it work out? Like, am I giving? I've thought about how close I can get to the camera. You know what I mean? In certain moments, and it's like, good lord, you know, and. Uh, <laughs> I wonder how many of us, well, I, I used to be worried that we'd all forget how to project because we're doing the, we're using <laughs> microphones, but then, but then they told us all we had to wear masks every day. So now we all have to project just to live. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh. That is so true. Yes, you're right. Like even you could be six feet away or even less than six feet away wear a mask and no one can hear you. Oh yeah. I mean, I use my outside voice the entire time I have a mask on. Like if I'm talking to people and here's the thing, I am not letting this like weird uh, scourge of friendliness, like take away my talking to strangers. I can't, (laughs) I tried it for the first couple months and I was like, don't talk to them. You can't talk to them. It's not okay to talk to them anymore. And then I was like, no, I want to talk. I want to talk to random strangers. I want to make jokes with strangers. I want to talk to people in lines. There's gonna be a lot of line standing. Mm -hmm. I need to talk to people in line. So I still do it. And I'm like yelling through my mask to like people six feet away from me in a, in a line at HEB going like, Hey, is it cold enough? Hey, you know, (laughs) um, 
I, we, we haven't been doing, we haven't gotten grocery stores or anything like that, but we've been pretty locked down, but we did go get, um, I think vaccinations. This isn't the COVID vaccine. This is like back in, I think June of last year, uh, July of last year, we went to like this clinic or my work has a clinic and, um, we were getting our shot. And I remember the receptionist have a joke and here I am laughing and I had a mask on it. And have you noticed that when you laugh with your mask, it's really weird. Like I just realized, oh my God, this is very strange. Here I am laughing at this wonderful joke this receptionist told me, but I find this very strange because the it's like the it's all muted. I don't know. I just felt very strange laughing in a mask. Oh, the whole experience of wearing a mask is horrific for people like us who want you to look at me. All I want is for you to look at me. Look yeah. at my face. Look at me. I cute. I only got a good looking face. The rest of it is kind of a wash. I need <laughs> you to see this. This is the area I got. So I need, and also my nose to chin region, best region, <laughs> best region, right? Well, All the expressiveness. I've literally worked for 40 years, 40 some odd years. Let's be clear. All right, audience, I'm, you, you know, hold on. Um, but like to develop wacky faces. Yes. Wacky faces, little like eyebrow pops of people. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like strangers and stuff like that. That's how I connect right now, man, I've had to do some serious eye acting. So <laughs> big deals. I brought back winking. Winking oh. is in. Winking is back. Nice. Saying it here. Everybody be aware. Winking is back. It's yes. okay because it's the only part of your face you can see. How are you going to connect with someone? And not sexy w winking. No. 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 Remember no. when winking was so offensive? No, not anymore. Don't sex. And we have to teach people how not to sexy wink. <laughs> I feel like there's no sex. I feel like there's not going to be any sex for a long time. Like, like it is not like sexiness is over. We're like, that's nice. Yeah, Put your clothes. If you're wearing a mask, you can wear that tank top. But otherwise, no. See, I think it's going to be the opposite. I honestly. Oh, yeah. Oh, totally. I think that people are going to, especially the ones that have been practic practicing it really strict. I think, especially the Gen Zers or younger millennials, they will definitely go balls to the walls crazy i mean i watch mm. tiktok I'm, oh. I'm, I'm obsessed with it i should not be but it is it's actually kind of a great communal sense of you know sadness that we all ex are experiencing <laughs> and i see a lot of um videos of like when the bars open and you can see like I'm going to dance like this you know I think people are going to go insane and I think they're going to wear the hoochiest of outfits and I think that people are going to be having tons of sex and there's going to be so many babies in the boom of 2022 I was like 2002 wow no 2022 <laughs> 2022 maybe i don't know i mean i read an article recently that said that sex was down like that there were fewer babies in the past yeah. year well everybody's sad yeah but you'd think spending all this time together that there'd be more sex but there is not there's less so the hanging out existing couples not doing it right but you're right i also agree to a certain extent that all this not touching that eventually when they're like, okay, it's cool to touch. It's just going to be like orgy party after orgy party after orgy party of like, like sex clubs are going to become a thing. And you're like, well, that's what it is. Like Berlin. Yeah. Like for real. I mean, like the, the roaring twenties were wild for a reason. They mm -hmm. told them they couldn't drink. And then they were like, hee hee, we're going to drink. And then they told them, be careful, don't touch. And they're going to be like, hee hee, we're going to touch. And there was a pandemic in 1918. Yeah. I mean, so it's a, it's a similar vibe in that way. 
I've I've been wor I've been looking at like the 1920s like events and I'm like oh this isn't good I don't want this this is not <laughs> I'm not interested in mobs and uh, and speakeasies I feel like this is bad this is not good we should not do this but uh, maybe that's good <laughs> who knows then I worry that I'm old because like you saying so you've aged yourself in the course of this discussion right so I am two years younger than you right. When you said you look at TikTok, I was like, oh, okay, well, maybe I can look. I was like, listen, old lady, I say to myself, don't, <laughs> don't download it. You, I don't download Snapchat. I don't download TikTok because I'm just like, it's not for you. It's not for you. You and your people, the Gen Xers and boomers took over Facebook. It's ruined now. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, it was created by Gen X, so. Right. You know? So it's, it makes sense that it would be, but, but at the same time, it's like, I don't want to go to TikTok and ruin it for everyone. I'll <laughs> swing on in and they're like, who's this lady? And I'm all like, Hey guys, what's going on? Um, so I'm really shy on TikTok. Like I only have two videos, actually I had a third one, but then I just found, I didn't like it. So I, kind of deleted it but the one thing the reason why I love it is because a I feel better with the younger generation like I'm so concerned about what the, I want to know what's going on not that I need to know the new songs or you know I don't want to be like Amy Poehler's character in uh, Mean Girls like what's the sitch or like you know <laughs> you know what's the 411 you know I want to just know how you know, people are feeling in quarantine. That was the main reason. And one of the, but what I got out of it was a lot of humor, a lot of laughter, and also the humbleness that I'm not that funny. There are much more funnier people out there than I am. And it's frustrating, but they are so great. And the, the videos that are out there are really phenomenal. And it, it's, and I don't know. And also I miss, you know, seeing shows and it is kind of like, you know, seeing one show after another show, like mini scenes. And yeah, it's it's really great, if, in my opinion. I do love all the creativity. I think there's been some really great things cre like built out of it. I am not on TikTok, but I'm still aware of that Canadian guy, Lubalin, who does the songs to, to, to Facebook fights. And God... <laughs> It's the best thing I've ever seen. And I know that there's people that have done stuff like that before, but it was just so well-timed to like a rough moment. And then somebody's like, check this out. I was like, oh. Yes, 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 yes. So uh, my first TikTok video is based off one of his songs. <laughs> um, and it's based off, it's like the vaccination, like, and it was the first one that he did about the whole, like, the ad. Anyway, it's, it. But that grew, and there's another one, another song, another version is some little kid singing um, some obscure references to Fortnite to um, Kanye's West song, American Boy, and it's blown up, and it's the next best thing, and people are just jamming to it because it's so creative. Like, this little probably eight-year-old boy just took, you know, these lyrics and made them their own. It's such a great collective you know, format. And I am like you, I don't do Instagram. I mean, I do if I'm want to show off something or, you know, and I, I don't know Snapchat. I've never downloaded it. And I hate Facebook. I mean, I'm on it. I mean, I, I kind of have to be these days, especially to see how people are doing or, you know, or to check on family members or friends. Um, I mean, this past week, it really helped, I think, with all the, the, the snowstorm and the power outages and stuff like that happening here in Austin. But um yeah no I and Twitter is just ugh, it's gross you know um it's so it's weird I have a great community on Twitter everybody hates it and they're not into it I don't know why or how I curated my Twitter but I have just pleasantness and lovely people I don't know I, I mean everybody has a negative spin on Twitter Twitter is my safe place like I my friends on Twitter there are people from all across the world who I'm randomly friends with and we have like 
we just sort of tag each other on things and like talk about stuff. And, you know, we, we have like a, a private message that we all talk on as well, but it's like, and I, there's a ton of strange, I mean, I follow like hundreds of people, right. But somehow everything that's on my timeline is like fine. It's like really? nice people and like, well, it's also a lot of like writers trying to like just do cool stuff or like people trying to be creative, but I don't know if people are weird or they're trying to start fights. I just sort of move past it. Plus there's also like a whole like Twitter joke writing scene, which I appreciate. There are some people that will never do stand up and will never do any sort of like live comedy in their lives, but they'll write these amazing tight little jokes yes. that they put in on Twitter. And I'm like, yeah, you know, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then that Twitter, like when you read the next like thread, next piece of the thread, they'll be like, oh, this is my nephew's GoFundMe, please donate. And that nephew probably, you know, paid for his cancer treatment. No, yeah, no, I understand totally what you're saying. But I think I follow it for political reasons, which has not been good for me or my mental health, I think. <laughs> no. Yeah. I turn off all the political stuff. I'm like, no, thanks. I don't need to know. What's that? You think something? Hey, I think stuff. Let's not talk about it. <laughs> That's cool. No, but I think one of the reasons why I really liked it was like back in... Yeah, no, I, I, I started Twitter for comedy because I was a huge fan of the show community and the Twitter and Reddit community for the show community was just massive and then for some reason you know things started becoming more a little bit more darker in the reality of things and so I became using I, I use Twitter a little bit more for political stuff but yeah I should not do that <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you know politics can get a little ranty especially on social media because it's just opinions you know yeah. give me a pundit all day <laughs> give me somebody with some knowledge I'm into it I'm like what who's that person oh they're the person in charge of the thing we're talking about great let's what do they have to say <laughs> like you know as opposed to a thousand think pieces that are like you know what I think you know how I think a power grid should work Okay, well, that's nice. It's not actually how they work, but good for you and your thoughts on the matter. Do you know anything about electrical engineering of any kind? No? Oh, okay, well, great. <laughs> I'm actually, I study, I am an electrical engineer, oddly enough, and I can't figure well, out. Well, yeah, you have the skills, but these randos trying to tell me how to, uh, right. we'll see, the right thing to do is, I'm like, okay. But even I don't think electrical engineers to that extent even understand the situation of what what the thing is and how it works. That's what's crazy about it because it's supposed to work a certain way. I mean, it's basic, but like in any, it's not even basic. Like, what kind of grid would you put like the most important things on? You put on a separate grid, right? You put them on a separate thing altogether, and then you would worry about certain, you know, you know, neighborhoods based off like you know like if you have you know nursing home or a hospice center or something of some sort I don't know it's just it's basic common sense and it's I don't know you don't have to be electrical you just I, I, what do I know <laughs> I think what what it sounds like your your theory on the whole thing it has to do more with city zoning laws than it has to do with uh i think it has that. to do with power grids because realistically I, one of the in, one of the weird things i'm I, I mentioned before but i'm from boston and in mm -hmm. boston like everything's pretty organized in a way that's like these things are in this area and this thing's over here but here I feel like it's a free for all. So you can have like, you can have like a store and then like three houses and then like an office building and then like a, you know, waste treatment plant and then like three more houses. Like it's not organized in such a way. No, exactly. And that's what's yeah. bothersome about it. It's like, it needs to be somewhat organized and I don't know, like what you uh -huh. said in Boston. Yeah. I mean, realistically, nothing's organized in Boston, but, you know, they certainly don't put houses next to stores. So right. that's it. Yeah. I don't know. That's right. Yeah. That is true, though, because they should be, like, for example, my neighborhood is really close to, 
houses. But yeah. But I find that also the there are houses on the same power grid as, you know, stoplights, which I assume they would be. I don't know. Yeah, I don't understand how any of it works. But I do appreciate the idea that we're trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, one last thing I wanted to ask you, you were talking about how, you know, during this time you've been working on, you know, you've taken some um, classes on Zoom and you're working on this project. You went to TikTok to like explore this new, you know, way of creativity that we all are a part of because now we all have to do it online. What is the thing, what's the creative thing that is, you know, nagging at you right now? Like, what's your jam? What's the thing that you've been thinking about? It doesn't have to necessarily be like, oh, I'm working on this project. You know, maybe it's like, oh, I just saw this video and it made me think X, Y, Z or whatever. Like, what creatively, what creative fire is being stoked in you right now by whatever, you know, thing, inspiration that's around you in your life? Um. Hi, it's a very good question. And it's in very, it's going in various directions, but I'm starting to think more about actually where I grew up, like home, home stuff, like being something inspired with the town that I grew up in, or I was born and raised in. So um, I think that there's a comfort in wanting to be home um, and just something I think maybe something that will come out of it um, regarding humor, trauma, I don't know. Um, that's where I'm kind of headed in my mind space. Uh, something to do with growing up in a small town. I'm not sure what it is yet, but we'll see because, yeah. I don't know what else to say about that. It's hard. Yeah, yeah, you just have, it's like the first kernel in the beginning of an idea and you're like, I'm just rolling it around. Yeah. Just yeah. a rock. I need to roll it around in some snow before it's a snowman. I don't know what it is yet. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't talk more because I myself don't know. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I like the idea of, you know, hearkening back on, you know, where you came from. And I wonder... Since COVID, <clears throat> I'm sure there's a lot of people who are, you know, thinking about that. You know, we've been forced into smaller communities than we were in before. And so now you're, you know, forced to say, are the people that are around me, uh, the people that I want to be around me? And then like, what do I want out of my life? You know, because being faced with all of this adversity and all of these quote unquote unprecedented events, you know, really makes you go like, okay, I need my tiny corner of comfort. And, you know, what, where can I find that? What can I do to get there? Right. So reflecting upon, you know, how we grew up and what that was like especially if it was a positive experience, you know, if, if like you had a great time with your mom and like all the adventures of randomly going around and performing, like <laughs> maybe it was great for you. Maybe it was, you know, maybe the story is about the two different points of view of the experience, you know, the childlike experience of like being happy and enjoying yourself. And then the darker adult world of like, you know, racism and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, xenophobia and whatnot there's there's always something about that and I mean personally for me when I teach improv I'm always talking to people about trying to channel their inner child like trying to remember who they were when they were a child because our childhood selves are the key to who we really are when we're children we don't judge you know what our thoughts or feelings are we just have them and then we get older and we get to like junior high and somebody says, hey, you have feelings that I think are unusual. And I judge you for them. And then all of a sudden your feelings are something that people can have opinions on. And you're like uh, changing what you're doing to make this person happy and that person happy. And eventually you've created a cloud around who you really are. And with creativity and with improv, I think it's really important to try to chip away 
at all those things that you built around yourself to to really get to who you are as your you know sort of base self because i think that's where creativity really lies and where you feel both most comfortable and you know open enough to express yourself and to explore other things i mean when we were kids we thought there were so many things we could do and as we get older and older you know people tend to feel like they can do less and that their opportunities are less and whether or not that's true or not because sometimes i i like to argue that they're not but again we've spoken about my naivete um that's possible <laughs> but the idea is like i feel like we're shutting our own doors we're telling ourselves you can't do that when you can like even the tiktok thing i was saying like i can't go on tiktok because i'm old i can do whatever i want yeah. i'm holding myself back right i'm making this choice to right. not engage in this new art form purely because i what feel embarrassed for being over 40 dumb no and it's it's actually something that I had to get over like initially when we talked about me starting out with improv you know i found myself talking more about how you know i was really i was really concerned about my weight and how i looked compared to everybody in the class you know, and especially my age, you know, and I found myself in this really dark place. And I think stuff like that could hinder you as well. And I feel like you just got to like, for me to get past it, it was a very raw moment. You know, and as long as you're connecting with people in class, that's great. If you're not, find a new class, you know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, not every group is going to work out. Right. I mean, I've definitely had classes where, you know, there's some people that get along and some people that don't. And I legitimately have to say to this group of people, it's been established that these people like each other and these people like each other. And as much as I'd like to try to force you all to be friends, I'm not gonna. So just do scenes with the people that you like, and then we'll get through this. Hmm. Like you don't have to do, you're taking a class. If you're uncomfortable, you don't have to do anything that makes you uncomfortable. If yeah. this person, if you don't want to be in a scene with this person, don't. If you don't want to be in the class altogether, please find another class. But if you want to like power through, then let's make adjustments because that's what life is all about. And, and life and thus improv or improv and thus life. But like the idea of making adjustments figuring it out as you go along, deciding how you're going to shift when the, what you thought was happening isn't what's happening, you know? So yeah. I, I find for me that improv has been a new way to look at living life. And, you know, I, like you started improv late. I didn't, I, didn't start improv until I was 30 and I didn't start improv until I moved to Austin. So like I went and lived in New York city. Listen to this. I lived in New York city, like during the height of UCB when it was starting, I could have been over there. I was not over there. I didn't know it was a thing. Nobody mentioned it to me in my Shakespeare classes in college. You know what I mean? Like I went to do theater <laughs> at NYU, right? I'm not trying to like, I didn't know that there were people down the street doing funsy games I could have gotten involved in. No, right? right? Like, what? So I totally understand what you mean about like trying to get into like a young man's game later. But I don't know. I mean, I've enjoyed being, I, I like, I've liked all of my time over 30. I think it's been a good time. Under 30 was a tumultuous part of my life. It was a lot. 20 to 30, whoo, 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 whoo. so much insanity. Yes. Um, you know? I like 20 to 25 was definitely the insanity part. I felt like 25 to 30 was 
st- stability part. And I felt like 30 to 40 was more stable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that one beautiful thing about any type of art form is that you don't have to worry about stability. You could just act out your crazy fantasy. Not, well, not crazy fantasies. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, you could live, build these. I mean, you can if you want. It depends on what the crowd's all about, right? Crowd is, if there's consent, go for it. But, well, also, crazy fantasies don't have to just be sex. You know, it can be like, man, what would it be like if, like, a duck was a lawyer? Let's see. Oh, well, I've, I've actually been in a scene, like, where <laughs> was a lawyer. So. Oh, I just pulled that out of the improv ether, and it was real. <laughs> Oh, man, that's so funny. Um, Lahari, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It has been really great chatting with you. I I really love chatting because for me, it's so interesting to talk to somebody who is literally experiencing the same community in improv, and yet we've had two totally different experiences. And I just, I think there's something great. It says something really great about the um, a breadth and amazingness of the Austin improv community, but also it's just like super cool to like meet you and hear about your adventures. Cause I'm like, Oh, that sounds cool. I want to do that. I want to do that thing. What? They are cool. Oh, I want to go hang out with them. Cool. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, thank you for having me. This is really great. And hopefully we'll play together on stage. Yeah, stage. Or Zoom. You never know. Yeah, or Zoom. (laughs) Zoom is also good, you know. But stage would be nice. I would like to stand on some wood slats uh, in front of any amount of people to 107,000. Seems fine. (laughs) Uh, yeah. You know, you know, it's funny. I'm one of those people who like loves big crowds, big, 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 big crowds. I love standing on stage and talking to large numbers of people. And so the idea, and I was really starting to do that kind of stuff before COVID hit, like doing like, you know, being a speaker at conventions and stuff. And I was like, oh man, this is really happening. And then it was like, no, it's not. You know, but I was like, oh, it's really fun to stand in front of big, large crowds and talk to them. That's the attention you're looking for there. (laughs) And I, yeah, I really do love that. I really love that too. But (laughs) We'll get our attention someday and it won't be yelling through our masks (laughs) and winking with our well-mascared eyelashes. Ah, hello. Ah, wink. For the life of me, so work on it. Just work yeah, on it. Have to work on it. Like, why is that twitch, Lahari? Oh, I'm trying to wink. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Yes But Why podcast. Check out all our episodes on yesbutwhypodcast.com or. Check out all the content on our network, HC Universal, at hcuniversalnetwork.com.